Welcome back to Wood Engineering. I'm Jeff Orochko from Carleton University. And in this video, I'm going to be doing an example of a tension member design in wood using the Canadian Standard 086. So we're going to go start to finish on this, including consideration of load combinations. And so I'm tasked with coming up with a tension member that has the following loads um, in, and these are the specified loads, um, not the factored loads. So we have dead load of 100 kilonewtons, live load of 50 kilonewtons, and a wind load of 60 kilonewtons. And I would have gotten these from a structural analysis um, where I have separated each of the load effects and figured out for this particular member, what are the loads uh, from the different, uh, the different types of specified loads. And I'm gonna have to take care of combining these and then considering how each of these uh, interfaces with the fact that um, I have a different KD or duration factor for each different load combination. And I'm gonna show a way for tension design where we can simplify that process a little bit so that I don't have to do every design calculation three times to check for each of the, you know, presumably three different KD factors that I could get for the different load combinations. Um, we are going to assume that this member has a connection. Of course, all members need to be connected somehow, and this can be very challenging. Um, so we're going to just make an assumption at first, since we haven't learned about connections, we're going to assume there's some kind of connection and that that connection has a net area of about 85% of the gross area. So we've had to cut out some of the section to make bolt holes, etc., so that we can actually connect. And we're going to assume that that connection is so good that it can resist the full tension load resistance, um, uh, or that it's going to be able to resist the full tension load that we're applying to this member. Okay, so that is non-trivial, and we'll find that when we do connection design, but for now, this is uh, just the assumption that we're going to make in order to be able to do the question. This is located in a humid area, or it's outside, so therefore we're assuming wet conditions, we're assuming that it's treated, and, but we are assuming also that it is unincised. Okay, and we're going to repeat this design for both lumber and glue lamps. So let's get started. The first thing that we're going to need to do is to consider the load combinations. And there are um, basically three or four different KDs that we could run into um, when we're doing uh, this kind of design. And the first is the short term. So if we if we look back at the um, at the standard, so if I just bring up this table from the standard, table 5.3.2.2. These are the different KD factors, and they are for different loading durations. So short term, we have 1.15, standard term 1.0, long term, which are like dead loads, are 0.65. And so depending on which load combination we're talking about, we're going to have to apply a different KD factor for the resistance that we compare to that factored load that results in from that load combination. So that makes wood design a little bit trickier than design in steel or concrete, because um, basically which load factor we're using actually affects the resistance, which isn't usually the case um, for design in other materials. And basically for whatever load combination we use, we're typically going to use whichever KD is associated with the shortest duration load that exists in that load combination. So if our load combination includes wind, for example, which is a short term load, then the resistance that we'll use to compare against that load from the load combination is going to include a KD of 1.15, reflecting short term loads. And there is um, one exception to that, which is that for cases where um, our dead load is greater than our specified standard term load, and standard term loads include live load and snow load, oops, um, we basically have an interpolation function. So the possible KDs that we're going to run into in this question are, um, first of all, possible KDs. First of all is a KD of 0 0.65. So that's if I have dead only. And I could have a KD of 1.15 if my load combination includes wind. And also, since in this case, the specified dead load is greater than the specified live load. So here we have dead load is 100 kilonewtons and live load is 50. So since the dead load is greater than 50, then um, we have a third option, which if I have dead and live in the same 
um, load combination, then I have my this interpolation function. 8, 4, 9. So this is from clause 5.3.2.3. And it basically says that for um, for load cases where um, my, my specified um, long-term load is greater than my specified standard term load, then I can use this interpolation function basically to calculate my KD, uh, which is the case here. So I plug in D and L into this. In the standard, it says PL, which is for long-term loads, divided by PS, which is for standard term loads, uh, which in this case are D and L here, and I get 0.849. So we're going to have some load cases that probably have this uh, 849. And uh, this, of course, has to be greater than or equal to 0 0.65 which it is. <clears throat> okay, so now we're going to go over each of our load combinations step by step. <clears throat> this is a rather laborious process, so um, it's going to take some time. I'm going to basically write, uh, I'll, I'll do the first couple, and then I'll write the rest out. So here are our load combinations for this question. Load combinations. Recall that D equals 100. L equals 50, and W for wind equals 60 kilonewtons. So basically, I'm going from this table in the standard, which is something that's replicated um, out of the National Building Code, which has these same load combinations. And for each of these load combinations, I'm going to consider one case, which is just the principal loads. And then I'm going to consider another case, which is principal loads plus the companion loads. So for a lot of these, I'm going to have two. So for example, for case two, I'm going to have one that has dead plus live plus wind. And I'm going to have another one that's just dead plus live. So there's two that I have to consider. If it's possible that my dead load will actually counteract the main load effect, like if my dead load is helping, then I should be also considering the case where dead load is 0.9 as well as when dead load is 1.25. In this case, dead load, live load, and wind load are all acting in the same direction. So dead load is always going to be hurting us in terms of um, applying factored load. So I'm only going to have to consider the 1.25 dead. So that takes out, you know, two potentially two combinations from every case. Okay, so I'm going to consider these one by one in turn. So first, load combination one, which out of that table is 1.4 dead without any um, companion load possible. So if I do that, then I get basically 140 kilonewtons because 1.4 times 100. Okay, then I'm gonna have load case 2A. Okay, this is 1.25 dead plus 1.5 live plus 0.4 W, which is my companion load. And if I do that calculation, then I get 224 kilonewtons. Okay, and then I'm gonna have to do a second one for load case two, which is the one without the companion load. 1.25 dead plus 1.5 live equals 200 kilonewtons. Now you might ask, you know, why do I have to do it with and without the companion load? Well, in this case, the companion load will always be creating a greater load effect. So um, really I can just consider the case where I have the companion load and not where I don't. But if I have a more complicated case where some of the loads are going in one direction <coughs> and some of the loads are going in the other direction, or if I'm looking at moment in a beam, for example, and some of the moments are positive and the other, um, some of the moments caused by other specified loads are negative, then I have to consider the different combinations because sometimes a companion load might help. It might make the total load lower and sometimes it might hurt. It might make the total load higher. The other case that I want to consider them here is because uh, LC2A includes wind, which means I'm going to use a KD of 1.15, whereas LC2B only has dead and live. So in that case, I have to use a different K. So not only is the load changing, but the resistance is also changing because the KD changes depending on which kinds of loads are included in my load combinations. So in timber design, now I have to consider both separately. Okay, so now I'm just going to go through all the rest and write them out, and um, then we'll talk about the KD.
in load case three, I have actually two cases where I have just a dead load plus a companion load because load case three is the one that's predominantly for snow. So you can see load case three has a 1.5 snow. So we don't have any snow in this case. So, but I have two different companion loads. So I'm checking two, two cases where I have um, either the live as my companion or the wind. So that's what 3A and 3B are. Okay, load case number five is for earthquake generally. So this is also one where I just have a 1.0 dead plus uh, the companion load by itself. <clears throat> okay, so now that we have the load cases, we can look at the K factors and see which K would apply to each of these load cases. So for load case number one, so this is KD. For load case number one, KD, it only has dead, therefore, KD is 0 0.65, it's long-term load. Load case 2A has wind in it, therefore I use the KD associated with the shortest term load, so my KD is going to be 1.15. 2B is just dead and live, and we saw before that for the load combination with dead and live only in it, since dead is greater than live, I can use this interpolation function and I get 0 0.849. So this is 0 0.849. Um, okay, so now for 3A, three, three I have uh, dead and live only. So again, this is going to be 0 0.849. 3B it has wind in it, so this is going to be 1.15. 4A has wind in it, so it's 1.15. And 4B has uh, wind in it as well, so it's going to be 1.15. And then the last one is only dead and live, so therefore KD is going to be 0 0.849 in this case. <clears throat> okay, so now we can see um, for all the different load cases, what's the associated KD factor that I need to include with that load case? Now, so one approach that I could take here is I'm going to, as I could find basically the maximum for each different KD and say, okay, so for this factored load, this is the factored load that's the largest for a KD of 0.65. And this is the factored load that's the largest for a KD of 0.849. And then this is the factored load that's the largest for uh, KD equals 1.15. So why don't we go ahead and do that? Okay, so we can see the largest one that has a 0.65 is the first one. It's actually the only one with a 0.65. So I could say 4KD equals 0 0.65 LC max. So this is a factored, this is basically a factored tension, TF equals um, 140 kilonewtons, right? And I can do the same thing for 0 0.849. TF is going to be, um, it's going to be LC2B, right? It's the one with the largest 0.84, it's the one with 8.849 that has the largest uh, load, right? So this one's going to be 200 kilonewton. So this first one was LC number one, and this one is LC number 2B. And for KD of 1.15, it's going to be um, LC4A. TF equals 234 kilonewtons. So you can see that, um, you know, one of these is obviously the largest, like 234 kilonewtons is the largest one. Okay, so I say, okay, that's the largest TF that I have to design for. But on the other side of the equation, when I calculate my TR, my resistance, I'm going to apply a KD of 1.15, which increases my strength. So it has a higher factored load, but it also has a higher strength, right? TF2 has a lower factored load, but it also has a lower strength because I have to modify it by KD equals 0.849. Right, and TF has a lower load still, but also a lower uh, KD. So it's not clear looking at these which one necessarily is going to govern. So one approach that I could take is I could calculate three different TRs: one for um, one for KD equals 0.65, one for KD of 0.849, and one for KD of 1.15. 
and then I can compare each one individually to the TF. And that's an approach that I've taken in, in um, some examples. But for tension, since the factored resistance is linearly proportional to KD, that means if KD doubles, the resistance doubles. If KD is half, then the resistance is half. You know, if KD is 0.65, then the resistance is 0.65. Then I can actually find out right now which of these load combinations is going to govern. Um, that does not work for every type of design. So for, for tension resistance, that's the case. But as we've seen in the compression resistance, um, and if you look at compression parallel resistance video, um, that KD is wrapped up not only in the main equation for PR, the resistance to compression, but it's also inside the equation for, um, uh, for uh, KC, which means that it's not the case that if KD is twice, then the resistance is twice. There's some other nonlinear function uh, that maps um, how KD changes to how PR changes. So I can't do this, what I'm going to do right now for tension parallel design, but I can do it here. And what I can do is, you know, we know that um, for TR, right, I have my resistance, you know, um, TR is proportional to KD, okay? So therefore, what I can do is I can just basically take my TF, CTF divided by KD, and see which one is higher, which one is the highest. Okay, so in this case, you know, if I say um, 140, so this is KD, of 0 0.65, 140 divided by 0 0.65 equals um, 215.4 kilonewtons, right? So basically I'm saying, you know, like since, since I'm gonna have to reduce my, my resistance by, you know, to 65%, so since I'm gonna have to multiply my resistance by 65%, if I want to get rid of that effect, what I can do is divide both sides by 0.65 and see what uh, resistance I would need if KD equals 1. So you see, so I'm basically saying here, um, uh, I, need, I need TR to be greater than TF, right? So TR needs to be greater than, um, sorry, this is a zero, it's, KD, KD times TR for if KD equals one has got to be greater than or equal to TF. Therefore, TF has to be, sorry, therefore TR, if KD equaled one, has to be greater than or equal to TF divided by KD. That's basically what we're doing here. Okay, so I'm basically removing the effect of KD. Okay, in order to be able to compare TRs equally one to the other. So for KD equals uh, 0 0.849, I have basically um, 200 divided by 0 0.849. And from that I get 235.4 kilonewtons. And for KD of 1.15, I'm going to get 234 divided by 1.15, which gives me 203.5 kilonewtons. So now I see that taking out the effect of KD by just dividing by KD, I can see that basically the KD of 0.849, that load combination, the load combination 2B, up here, this is the one that's going to be critical for my design. So now going forward, I'm going to just use that as my design criteria. Assume KD equals 0 0.849 and TF that I'm designing for equals 235.4 kilonewtons. Okay, and then I'm guaranteed in this case 
to get the worst case uh, the worst case scenario for my design. So this is the highest one. Okay, so now let's take that information and try to design a member for a lumber. So I'm gonna to try to design this um, a lumber member to satisfy this requirement, this TF and this KD, which takes into account uh, all of the load combinations that um, combine the dead load, live load and wind load on this member. So for lumber, so basically I have my TF equals 235, 235.4 kilonewtons and my KD equals 0 0.8, 0 0.849. Okay, so let's uh, collect a little bit um, more information here. So basically what I do also know is that I'm gonna have some service condition so if I go to, uh, since this is wet, if I go to my service condition table for a lumber, okay, I'm gonna see service condition for tension is 1.0 for dry, so we're not that, but 0.84 for wet, in, uh, or 1.0 for wet, depending on whether the least dimension of my member is 89 or less or 89 or more. So I don't actually know going into this whether, um, what my service condition factor is because I don't necessarily know what size the member is that I'm going to come out with. Okay, so let's keep that in mind. Um, if I end up with a big member, it's going to be 1.0. If I end up with a smaller member, it's going to be 0.84. As far as treatment factor goes, we said it's um, treated but unincised. So that factor is going to be one. So that's not going to affect my strength. And um, size condition we'll talk about in a minute. And KH, which is our system factor, um, we only have one member that we're designing, so the, the member is all by itself, which means it doesn't satisfy case one or case two. And so if that's the case, that means that KH equals one. Okay, so the only thing I have potentially modifying my design is that um, KST, the service condition factor, is going to be either zero or um, 0.84. So KST is going to equal zero uh, sorry 1.0 or 0 0.84 depending on if it's big member or if it's going to be a small member okay which we don't know yet okay so now taking this information what i want to do is i'm going to use the design tables because um, just coming at this from scratch and trying to assume a size and then check it is going to take a really long amount of time so uh, i'm going to go to my design tables and um, take a look. Okay, so here is my tension member selection table. So if you go to the wood design manual, uh, and this is in volume one, and basically I go to the section four, chapter four, which is the design of tension members, then I'm going to see there's all of these design tables. And if I go to the beginning of this section, it's going to tell me what these design tables are appropriate for. And this is a kind of important, um, an important table because it says, okay, so for the design tables, these are the things that we have assumed um, when we came up with all of the numbers. Okay, so you can see here, checklist for lumber and glue lamb design tables for tension. The load duration is standard. So they assume in the table that KD equals one. Is the tension member acting as a single member, KH? So they're assuming that KH equals one. They're assuming that the service condition is dry. So KST equals one. And they're, in, they're also assuming that KT, uh, that there's no incisions or strength reducing chemicals. So KT is also one. Okay, so we saw that it is the case mostly for us that these are true. But one thing that is not is that KD is not one because our KD is 0.85. Okay, so that means that our strength is gonna be 85% of what the strengths are as listed in the table. So we have to take that into account when we're picking a member. We need to pick a member that's a bit stronger than what our actual um, our actual strength is that we've written down here. And we can figure out exactly what that is because, um, oh, I'm sorry. I made a mistake back here. So if I'm using 0.849, um, this actually, the TF has to be 
200, which is the original, the original TF. Um, 235 would be what is my um, what is my strength if I divided by 0.849, which is actually what I want now. Okay, so <clears throat> going forward, we're going to assume that KD equals 0.849 and TF is 200. But then down here, so I'm going to fix this too. Down here, when I am going to the table, what I can do is say, okay, well, if KD was 1.0, what would the strength that I need? Which takes into account the fact that when I go to the table, I actually have to reduce the strengths by 85%. So I can say for the table, look for T at TR, Oh, sorry, for TR greater than or equal to 200 divided by 0 0.849, which equals 234.5. Okay, so this, oh, sorry, 235.4, other way around. 235.4. Okay, so that helps us when we go to the table, instead of having to do that math in our head where we say, okay, all these tables need to be divided by 0.85, or need to be multiplied by 0.85. I'll just divide by 0.85 to get what my target should be. Okay, so let's go back to that table. We know from our question that we uh, are supposed to use lumber SPF number one grade. Okay, so that's gonna be what we look at when we go to the table. So just remember the number 235. Okay, so here's my table, I'm gonna scroll down until I get to the actual tables. They have some nice design examples in the um, handbook. Okay, so here's the beginning of the timber men member selection tables for lumber, which is what we're looking for right now. And this is for lumber sizes that have a small dimension of 38. And so you can see this is all the different 38. So here's SPF and we're looking for number one. So we're in this area here and we can see that for all the 38 buys, so these are all the two by lumbers, we have strengths of 25 up to 53 and we need 235 so this is too low so let's keep going down here's the 64 um yep here's the 64 by ones okay spf number one is over here here are the strengths it's a little bit different than the table above okay let's go for because those it's because those 38 members they come in machine stress rated and these ones i guess do not um so here we have uh, SPF number one. We're still only maximum. The biggest one is 126. So we have to keep scrolling, keep scrolling, keep scrolling. This one is getting kind of close. I could potentially use this one, 191 by 241. Um, and here I have 241 by 241. So that's a 322. Okay, so this is since this is a tension member, um, I'm going to use a square member. That's kind of an arbitrary situation in this case. Um, uh, because um, I think that this one is not going to be big enough. And the reason that, that I didn't choose this one is because um, there's one other effect. So this one is pretty close. It's 230, 255 and I need 235. But what I haven't considered yet is the fact that I have a reduction in my net area. Right, and that net area reduction is going to reduce the strength um, by another 15%, right? Because my net area was 85%. So this one's not going to be big enough. So I'm going to size up one more to a 241 by 241. And boy, it's a good thing that that one works because that turns out to be the largest piece of lumber that I can get. So 241 by 241, SPF number one, I have 322. That should be plenty. So I'm going to go back to my design. Okay, so I'm gonna select SPF number one, 241 by 241. Okay, and so the, the table says that I should be more than fine, but what I'm gonna do now is go through all the calculations and um, show you exactly that everything's gonna be fine because, you know, as I mentioned, those tables are only um, only applicable to certain conditions, KD equals one, KH equals one, KS equals one, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so the first thing that we have to do is find the strength of this member. 
So it's 241 by 241. So if I go to the tables to figure out what the strength of that is. Okay, so it's 241 by 241, which means that I'm looking at um, a post and timber because it's greater than 114, but the larger dimension exceeds the smaller dimension by 51 or less. So I'm looking at a post and timber member. So then I have to go to the post and timber table, which is 6.3.1D. And I read SPF number one, and I'm looking for tension parallel to grain. So I get this number, 5.6. So my FT equals 5.6 MPA. Okay, my AG, which is my gross area, is 241 by 241, which equals 58081 millimeters squared. Okay, my KH, as we mentioned, is 1.0. That's our system effect factor. Our KST, now since our member is big, it's 241 by 241. So if I go to my service condition table again, then I see, okay, KST, my least dimension is greater than 89. So it turns out my KST is 1.0. So I don't actually have a reduction. So KST is 1.0. So even though we're in a wet condition, we don't have any reduction for strength. KT equals 1.0. We already determined that. And um, the last one is my KZ. And my KZT I have to get from a table. Right? It's this table here. And my KZT, so I'm looking larger dimension, is 241. So I'm here and I read across to KZT and I get a KZT of 1.1. Okay, so now I'm going to find my net area reduction, AN, and we assumed that it's 85 times AG. This is not always the case, obviously. This is an assumption that we made. So usually I have to calculate the actual net area. But in this case, that's going to be 49369 millimeters squared. So now I can calculate my large FT, which, as you recall, is FT times KD times KH times KST times KT. So I have 5.6 times 0 0.849 times 1.0 times 1.0 times 1.0, and so I get FT equals 4.76. And now I'm ready finally to do the TR, right? Which you'll recall is phi FT AN times KZT, the size effect factor. Phi is 0.9, 4.76, 49369, and KZT is 1.1. And when I do that whole thing, I'm basically going to get something in Newtons, right? So I'm going to get 232500 0, 0 Newtons approximately, which equals 232.5 kilonewtons. Why do I get Newtons? Because basically I'm multiplying MPA. So this one here is an MPA. This is in millimeters squared. MPA is newtons per millimeter squared equivalent, right? It's it's a million newtons per meter squared. Okay, so that means that um, um, if I multiply MPA times millimeters, I'm going to get newtons. So that's the number I'm going to get, and then I have to convert it to get kilonewtons. Okay, and here I'm going to say recall that TF was 200. This was the load case that governed, right? Therefore, TR equals 232.5 kilonewtons is greater than TF equals 200 kilonewtons. Then I might want to sum up my final design is SPF number one, 241 by 241. And that's my final design.
Okay, I'm gonna put a break in the video and then in part two, we're going to do the exact same design, but for Glulam.